Hello, everyone. My name is Alfonso Martinez. I am a, an MBA student at MIT, at the MIT Sloan School of Management, and I am incredibly excited to have you here today. I am, I feel fortunate that you are joining us today, both you, the person that have expressed interest in participating, as well as you, the partner that has made this possible, and you, the team that has made this entire event happen in less than two weeks. We are gathering this weekend to put together an immense amount of talent in the same place to develop solutions to tackle the most pressing problems that impact that are related to our COVID-19 crisis. We, over the last two weeks, have been working with the support of the MIT community, as well as the broader healthcare and technology ecosystems to bring together the, a community of individuals that are not only interested in having an impact, but also in developing solutions that can have a meaningful impact on the, on the crisis. I see that there's a lot of people in the chat and I was, I'm getting distracted with the chat, so apologies for that. So what are we doing today? If we go to the next slide. So we're here in the MIT COVID-19 challenge, which is a series of virtual hackathons all focused on this crisis that we're experiencing at a global scale. This is going to happen virtually. This is going to happen throughout the weekend. It's a 40, it's a 48 hour exercise and you can learn more at our website that you guys all have been to. If you go to our next slide, I want to show you the amount of support that we've received. If we go to the next slide, we've received in less than two weeks, over 4,500 applications from almost every state in the U S and 96 countries. That's insane to me. And we've received a wealth of support from mentors, 500 mentor applications that have all said that they want to come join this weekend to help you develop the most meaningful and impactful solutions that we can put together in a short period of time. With this amount of support, we had to whittle it down with what we're able to accommodate for a weekend. So we ended up selecting you, one of the 1500 selected participants and about 200 mentors to work together in teams to tackle 10 challenges in generally two problems. We're focusing this, we go to the next slide, this weekend in two general problem areas. How can we best support our health systems in the midst of this crisis? And how can we protect the most vulnerable populations from the effects of this COVID-19 crisis? If we go to the next slide, you'll see the first five. You all should have been exposed. You all have been exposed to these prompts. These are five prompts that relate to how we can protect vulnerable populations in a more concrete way. And we're going to hear from our clinical partners via video now, right in a few minutes, um, explaining each one of these in further detail. So I'm not going to go through them in a lot of detail now because we're going to spend a good amount of time doing that. So we go to the next slide. Um, the key things about this hackathon that I want to highlight are the fact that, first of all, this is a hackathon, a virtual hackathon that has the healthcare ecosystem infused in it. It stemmed out of the, obviously a healthcare need and, and many, many problems that expand healthcare, but this is only stand out of the healthcare need, but also it's been supported and made happen by the healthcare ecosystem. So we have a lot of providers here, not only engineers. So we have the opportunity of bringing this incredibly talented minds together to build relevant solutions. One other, another key thing that this is very important to highlight that it might be different from other hackathons that you might have participated in the past is the fact that this event the goal of this event is not only developing amazing solutions over a weekend, but developing solutions that can be implemented. So we're focusing on this weekend, 
but we're also focused, doing a heavy, heavy focus on what's happening after this weekend, the post-hackathon activities that we hope that many, many solutions that are developed this weekend can leverage the resources that we, we're lining up for the post-hackathon implementation and, and, and impact of these solutions. And finally, we want to highlight that the concept of the MIT COVID-19 challenge is a series of virtual hackathons. This is our second event, much broader than our first one, but it, it is a series of events that will all target the most pressing issues that our both healthcare ecosystem and our society generally are facing at that given point in time. So more to come on future events. We go to the next slide. I now want to pass it to Bill Oled, the Managing Director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, who's been one of the individuals from MIT and for generally the overall the, the entrepreneurship ecosystem that has been pushing us the most to make this happen. As soon as we expressed, like talked to Bill about this, Bill was not only on board, he was one of the ones that pushed us the hardest to make things happen now and to, and to scale it to the level that we've been able to. So Bill, let me pass it to you. Thank you very much, Alfonso. And I can't tell you what an honor it is to, to be here and, and thank you for asking us. Um, the, I first have to acknowledge that it, it's your leadership, it's Freddie's leadership, it's Stephanie's leadership as students that show that to make this happen, Paul Cheek is, at, is here. This didn't exist, you know, five, uh, not five weeks ago. It didn't exist like three weeks ago. And uh, so you, the leadership that you guys have exhibited to, and the rest of the team is just extraordinary and shows you that you can make a difference. Um, let me just, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go quickly here because I don't want to repeat some of the things that uh, Alfonso has already said, but this is an unprecedented time of crisis. Um, I'm from New York City. New York City, someone dies every nine seconds now. It's actually faster than that. Um, the ambulances are being used more than they were used during 9-11. They're having more of a crisis with that. It is literally like a post-apocalyptic uh, movie where you go down the street and there's nobody there except ambulances and, and flashing and taking people to the hospital. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that that's the most important or the only place I see people from um, Italy on here, people from Spain and, and as well as um, France and India. This is a global problem. And uh, it is so fantastic that you are all working on it. And let me just say, it's not just a health problem. It's a problem that was started in the healthcare area. And we can focus on genetic sequencing if we want, but that's not going to necessarily deal with the overall problem. We have a humanitarian crisis. We have an economic crisis. And we also have a mental health crisis. The, the, you know, obviously the humanitarian crisis with people dying and losing their livelihood. We have an economic crisis that people are being dislodged that 6.6 .6 million people are now unemployed in the United States in the past week. But we also have a mental health crisis of what are people going to do? We, you know, just how does this affect people? You're seeing, you know, um, sales of alcohol go up 75%. You're seeing domestic violence increasing. You're seeing depression increasing. Time is of the essence. And this is what I, I push Stephanie and and uh, Alfonso when they said, we're all behind this at MIT, but no one person can do it alone. It takes a community. So I would encourage you all to think fast, think big. We have got to solve this problem. Um, and this is where hacking can really make a difference. Don't try to go for the technology prob problem. Look at the problems like that you've been issued here. Those are problems that you can solve with hacking. If you want to try to come up with the genetic sequencing, you need a laboratory. You need scientists exclusively in a specialized team. The things that you can do are listed here, and they can have a huge, huge difference. Um, I just want to say we've been thinking a lot about this, you know, in the past two weeks. And what's going to solve us this problem is hope. We all have to know and have faith 
that we are going to get through this. And the second thing is we need strength, not just to know we're going to get through it, to know we're, we have agency here. That means we have confidence that we can make a difference. And that's what this is all about. But you can't just have hope and strength. You have to have guidance here. And so you're going to be working on a team with people who have extreme capability in one area, and you're going to bring capability in another. And that guidance will create the last one, which is community and team. And these four things are what we need to get through this and not just survive it, but thrive. When we get to the end of this, there's going to be untold opportunities to do good things. And that's what this is all about. Um, I want to just, you know, make sure that everybody understands that problems aren't solved by individuals. You know, that's, that's what you see in uh, the movies. But what happens in, uh, sorry, what happens in real life is teams solve problems. And that's what this is all about. Um, you, you know, uh, Alfonso went through how many people applied and you've been chosen to do that and you're skilled, you're a diverse group of people, you have doctors, nurse practitioners, designers, technical people, um, all respect each other and that's what makes for a great team. Um, I also think it's unbelievable, I'm looking at you know 74 different countries. The use of technology here is something that we can use to battle this very, very quickly. And it's so exciting to see what's going on here and, and this just being the, the, net, the beginning of what we hope is an ongoing virtual hacking medicine where you don't, you're not constrained by physical. It, and the, 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 last, the last thing I wanna say is that, um, you know, we're gonna come out of this and we're gonna come out of it together and the idea you come up with today might not work. But there's this thing called the Stockdale Paradox. We have to stick with it. If it doesn't get solved today, think of all the people that you've met. Think of the community you've built and then come back at a, maybe a slightly different problem or the problem a different way. And that's what's even more valuable. When I've, we've looked at these hackathons, yes, you're gonna hear from John Bloom about how his idea came out to be a company. But more often than not, the greatest value in a hackathon is the other people that you meet the community that you develop, that powerful network. Because as, as my favorite saying is, the strength of the pack is in the wolf. And here it is. The strength of the wolf is in the pack. Uh, I mean, the strength of the pack is in the wolf. So each one of you is very strong. But the strength of the wolf is in the pack. By that it means you all will be so much more powerful than any one individual will be if you all work together. And that's what makes this event so very, very powerful. So with that, I will turn it back over to Alfonso and Freddie and, and Stephanie and my hats off to you. You are, for those of you who don't know, they were named anti-fragile heroes at MIT this past, past week. And uh, they're getting uh, recognized for that. So Alfonso, I turn it back to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Bill. With, for, like, without further ado, I'll, I wanna pass it to Freddie Will now. Actually, I want to do mention something. I do want to recognize that and highlight that this effort has been put together and amongst a group of 25 individuals, both from the MIT community as well as the professional ecosystem in the Boston and general and New York area, where you'll get to meet many of these individuals, depending on the, on the different tracks that you're going to be working on, that all have done insane amount of work to make this happen and obviously i think one of the ones that we need to highlight the most is freddie who i think has slept maybe two hours in the last 48 but it making sure this happens and that we have a very high quality event freddie let me pass it to you uh, thanks alfonso um and i think just to kind of highlight some of the what was mentioned before, um, so myself, uh, I am actually a resident at Mount Sinai Hospital. So by day, I'm actually, you know, on the front lines trying to uh, do my best clinically in terms of fighting the COVID-19 um, crisis. And so I'm really looking, as, you know, sort of a lot of my counterparts uh, in the medical community looking for really a lot of you guys to help build some of these solutions so that you know, we can together as a community uh, really solve uh, this problem. Um, 
But without further ado, I wanted to kind of move to hearing from our clinical partners. So I might have to say stop and reshare here. Give me one second. Uh, but to turn it over to hearing from our clinical partners. Uh, is that coming through at all? Hi, my name is Yuna. I am representing Law Criminal Medicine Lab and Treaty Lab and Future of Care Organization. So our problem is focused on protecting the vulnerable populations. And our main question is who should we test for, test for COVID-19 and when? So before I explain further, um, I'm going to give you a little bit more background of the problem. So it's true that coronavirus does not discriminate by race or economic status, but um, our public records have been showing that COVID-19 is already showing familiar patterns of racial and economic bias. So for example, New York Post has constructed COVID-19 cases, a map of COVID-19 cases all across New York City, and has shown that the highest incidence of COVID-19 cases are concentrated in the outer boroughs and the poor neighborhoods. And this is not a problem unique to New York City. For example, in Memphis, uh, they had constructed a heat map of COVID-19 um, testing that is taking place all across the city. And it shows that most screening is happening in mostly in the uh, white and well-off suburbs and neglecting the poor neighborhoods. And for example, in Milwaukee, uh, the first eight fatalities with COVID-19 were all African Americans. For this issue, there's multiple factors that affect it. And of course, there's many ways and approaches that we can take to fix this problem. And one of the ways that we want to target is by um, focusing on the testing aspect of the problem. So one of the critical problems in this crisis is uh, our limited availability of testing and sometimes taking days in some parts of the country to get the testing results processed, and which also leads to delayed ident identification of COVID-19 cases. And this, like I had mentioned, has disproportionately affected the poor neighborhoods. So this is our question. With such limited testing available and sometimes results taking days to process in many parts of the country, how can we speed up the process and better triage the patients and test reporting? How can we easily and effectively identify patients across different neighborhoods as well as test, uh, healthcare workers who should be tested for COVID-19? How can we identify patients with pre-existing condition, conditions and or healthcare workers who may be at a higher risk for exposure and adverse outcomes? So for example, targeted testing, monitoring with uh, prediction models in New York City could be an effective strategy to uh, flatten the curve that we've been talking about. Thank you for your help and we look forward to your solutions. Hello, I'm Paul Stefanacci, Chief Medical Officer at Universal Health Services. The team at UHS clearly understands that COVID-19 is having a significant impact on vulnerable populations and wants to act to improve treatment and management to protect these patients. Current clinical treatment of COVID-19 has become somewhat of a decentralized, not controlled clinical trial, creating the potential for inefficiencies in care delivery. The challenge is, how do we best collaborate to support development and collect the data necessary to determine safe and effective COVID-19 clinical care pathways that can be shared across all healthcare systems? Patients deserve to receive scientific-based compassionate care. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced healthcare to respond in an unprecedented fashion, to design treatments and provide healthcare under challenging and rapidly changing circumstances. While the efforts of healthcare providers has been tremendous, currently there is no comprehensive treatment recommendations supported by robust clinical evidence. The current treatment guidance is based mostly on experience. Interpreting results and effectiveness from COVID-19 experience, however, is complicated. 
as variable medication regimens and various treatment modalities have been utilized. This has resulted in multiple treatment protocols being used to treat COVID-19 patients, making interpretation of results difficult. The intent of constructing this challenge is to support protocol development and evaluate the effectiveness of care delivered during the COVID-19 crisis in order to optimize and establish effective comprehensive care protocols. Currently, many potentially beneficial treatments for COVID-19 reside in silos and are in various stages of development. This fractured approach does not allow for a consistent platform to design comprehensive clinical protocols and evaluate safety and effectiveness. Patient care during COVID-19 would be greatly enhanced if clinical pathways could be designed from an informed scientific method and shared broadly. This would invariably lead to better health outcomes. The challenge is to balance scientific rigor against the urgent need to identify an effective treatment creating the capability to support the development of data-driven solutions could facilitate the design of customized clinical pathways that drive better health outcomes during the crisis. Key items to consider as we take on this challenge. One, develop an efficient clinical trial framework tailored to this outbreak. Two, establish clear treatment protocols that allow for maximum patient enrollment. Three, create trials that make it easy for COVID-19 patients to receive recommended treatment. Four, design novel approaches for data collection that are suited to the challenge of evaluating protocols in the setting of a public health emergency. And five, develop a process to evaluate treatment outcomes in an expedited fashion. Ultimately, we seek to establish evaluation and treatment protocols that enable providers throughout the care continuum to assess patients accurately and provide effective tailored treatment plans. Doing rigorous clinical research during an outbreak is a challenge, but it's the best way to make headway against the virus. We are so grateful that you are taking your weekend so that together we can connect the best minds to solve our biggest challenges while facing COVID-19. The objective is to provide promising treatments to patients who would benefit from them now and ensure we deliver the best possible care for patients with COVID-19. We cannot wait to see the solutions you put forth. Thank you for your commitment. Let's get after it. Hi, my name is Ferdinand Huey, and hello from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins Hospitals, and I am a neurointerventionist. I treat brain aneurysms and stroke. A very fast word about stroke, this is a rapidly changing part of the healthcare system. We have a new surgical treatment for stroke with strong benefits, 91% good outcome in patients that we are able to be canalized in under uh, 200, 150 minutes, two and a half hours. We are actively using artificial intelligence in triage of the patients. We're developing new systems of triage as well as new methods of delivering care. Uh, we are trying to move this worldwide and it puts me in a very unique situation to understand the types of things that need to happen rapidly to do better work and helping our COVID patients. As you know, this is a once in a generation or perhaps once in every two generation challenge. Since 1918, we have not had such a significant worldwide healthcare challenge as this. We are still having rapid growth in the number of patients worldwide, particularly in the United States. So what are we here to talk about today? Triage at home. One of the challenges in a massively infectious process is that getting healthcare represents an infection risk. Going to clinics, ex risk exposure to COVID. Going to clinic exposes healthcare workers to COVID. Going to clinic means that potentially patients that weren't infected become infected and patients that are infected infect other people. 
this completely changes the kinds of dynamics that we normally assume in healthcare. Layperson knowledge, as you know, is also limited. There are lots of disinformation currently going around the internet. Uh, this is a public messaging problem and there are so many places you can get information and many of it may conflict. One other aspect is that clinical care that brings patients into contact with providers means that we have to use protective equipment. Use of protective equipment, which is presently in short supply, uh, means that we're taking up a valued and limited resource every time we touch a patient. And that's why we need to talk a little bit more about potentially triage at home. And what does triage mean? Triage, if you haven't heard the term before, uh, relates to what you used to do in the military. When you had patients or soldiers injured, you assessed how bad their wounds were. Do they, are they able to go back to battle immediately? Are they able to be treated near the front lines? Do they need to be sent back to a military hospital or perhaps go back uh, to the home country where perhaps there's nothing to do and they die? So triage is trying to make real-time assessments on what needs to be done for a patient or in the war zone, uh, a, a soldier that's been wounded. Presently, there are health systems that are regionally overwhelmed with both high and low acuity needs. What do we mean by that? Imagine for a moment that you are in New York. You are a COVID positive patient, or at least you think you are. How do you get care? Do you go into the hospital and potentially infect other people? Uh, that's a problem. How do we test you? How do we figure out what you've actually got? Um, this is a very large group of people with all the colds and flus and COVID Separating these people is very difficult. Uh, the development, and this is probably in another uh, presentation, the development of accurate tests at, that can be used at each of these uh, levels of care are probably very helpful in assessing what the patient needs, disease prevalence, and infection rates actually are. So that's the high acuity stuff. What else is there? How about low acuity? Let's say you're in New York and the hospital is currently overwhelmed with COVID patients, and now you have sepsis, you are having appendicitis, you're, now you need potentially surgical care, or at least evaluated for surgical care, but you can't get in because the hospital is absolutely full of COVID patients. Worse, or maybe not worse, but let's say you are a, a, a cancer patient. You need chemotherapy. You're kind of in between. You're not the highest acuity, you're not actively dying per se, but you need constant care. Or maybe diabetes, that's a low acuity need. Somebody needs to manage your meds. These patients currently are having a very hard time getting care because these uh, overloaded healthcare systems don't have capacity uh, to treat anything other than COVID. So this is very different from other parts of the country where presently there isn't high infected rates so these places are getting ready for the COVID, uh, COVID surge, and actually they have spare capacity. Most healthcare systems are currently putting off elective surgeries in order to prepare for overwhelming COVID needs. Uh, so how can we do a better job? We have healthcare workers that can theoretically do patient triage, but they don't have access to the patients that need it. Uh, patient education is available, but it's patchy and not been centralized or coordinated by either government or institutions. That means there's a lot of duplicated work. Um, so we have the opportunity through telecommunications to perform work remotely. It can save system critical personnel time and resources, particularly in disaster zones where there's tremendous amounts of COVID. Many things can also happen outside hospital walls. We can talk about follow up for patient test results, uh, patient education and isolation reinforcement triaging sick patients into appropriate care facilities. The best case scenario is when we are able to create systems that can triage patients when they're still at home. They are sheltering at home. They're not infecting other people. They're reducing their own infection risk and we're managing their care from a uh, telemedicine platform. So this is a, of a, a tremendous amount of interest. It's something that I'm currently working on and very, very attuned to. Thank you very much for paying attention and good luck to you guys in developing solutions for COVID. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Kyle Moore. I'm Vice, Prim, Vice President of Inventory Services for the UHS uh, Acute Care Division. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the MIT COVID Challenge. One of the challenges we would like to propose is this. We recognize the need to change the delivery of care in this new COVID world. With the increasing risk of virus expansion and cross-contamination, we need to develop programs that minimize the risk of cross-contamination of the communities we serve, as well as contamination of our providers and clinicians. Therefore, we need to be able to treat patients outside of our facilities with alternative approaches in order to prevent the patients that do not need acute care interventions from even coming to our facilities. Additionally, we need to develop programs for clinical care that transition patients to their home environment faster. By getting people out of our facilities faster, we should be able to minimize their risk of potential exposure. Additionally, from a practical perspective of the communities we serve, many health disparities exist as a result of the financial resources, which in turn leads to a lack of access to clinical care that we should hopefully be able to deliver on from these type of innovations. And from a strategic perspective, there's no greater place to create loyal than it, loyalty than in the homes of the communities we serve. You know, therefore, developing technology solutions that communities can access in their safe environments will help us improve the health of the communities we serve. What solutions would be interest, of interest to us? We are interested in clinical programs and or technology solutions that enable our clinicians to provide care in remote settings that will assist in avoiding unnecessary cross-contamination. These clinical programs can be based on new methods of care that could include technology solutions. Some solutions that could be considered are the use of remote monitoring devices and or technology interventions that are linked to clinicians for more timely exchange of relevant information that empowers the clinician and patient to communicate in advance of any unnecessary direct contract, contact between the patient and providers. Barriers considered, there's quite a few of them. The capital commitments for this can be very significant. Additionally, the innovation of technology, technological capabilities has continued to progress at a pace that is faster than the ability to transition healthcare system operations. Reimbursement for this capability has not been established by CMS and the payer community. Clinical capacity is also limited as a result of the current pandemic. Furthermore, the workforce development of for providing this non-traditional concept of care is different and has not been developed. Customer understanding and acceptance of alternative clinical delivery can be a challenge for certain market segments of the population as well. With that, I'd like to thank you and look forward to your recommendations and how we can deliver solutions to this challenge. Thank you and look forward to seeing the results of your hard work. Hi, I'm Carrie Cook and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, my colleagues in internal medicine, emergency department and the ICU are overwhelmed on the front lines taking care of COVID patients. Uh, we in the ambulatory setting are um, trying to continue treatment for patients with cancer um, and to the best of our ability, prevent them from contracting COVID while they're on treatment. Um, now, the most up-to-date data that we have um, shows a hospital bed shortage of close to 90,000 in the United States and an ICU bed shortage of close to 20,000 beds during the peak. And to prevent uh, further overwhelming the emergency departments and hospitals, um, it's important to educate patients on how to um, accurately triage their symptoms, monitor their symptoms, um, to prevent them from coming to the ED when they don't need to. This is particularly important in uh, vulnerable populations such as patients with cancer and other healthcare conditions um, because coming to the emergency department when they do, don't need to could unnecessarily expose them to COVID. And as we know, they're at a higher risk of serious complications and death from COVID. Um, now working with cancer patients every day, um, many of them are particularly fearful um, because some of them are immunocompromised from chemotherapy or other treatments. 
and many of them have symptoms that from their cancer that overlap with symptoms from COVID. And when they're on treatment, um, you know, when someone's getting radiation, they may need to come every day for treatment. And uh, within the Department of Radiation Medicine at OHSU, we're doing daily temperature checks and symptom screens. Um, but for people who aren't coming every day, um, they may not know where to go for information about um, their symptoms and when they should think about coming to the emergency room or not. In addition to patients with chronic health healthcare conditions, um, the vulnerable populations include those in underserved areas who may not have access to information um, about when to come or not come to the ED. Um, but providing these communities with education about that um, has the potential to seriously reduce the burden on the healthcare system. So well-informed, data-driven, at-home triaging that can be widely implemented is desperately needed both to uh, reduce the burden on the healthcare system and also prevent unnecessary exposure uh, for patients coming into the UD. My name is Dr. David Sheridan. I'm on faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Oregon Health Science University. And the problem that I am submitting is really how we use our current existing space and retrofit other space to best care for patients during the COVID and other pandemics that we may see in the future. So one thing that we've learned from Italy is that separating our ERs is a really critical component to the care that we provide in particular creating a respiratory part of the emergency department and a non-respiratory part. We here at, at Oregon Health Science University have undergone a huge renovation in the past uh, couple weeks, which has involved splitting our ER into multiple different zones and areas. Those areas now consist of various walls where patients who are without respiratory complaints, so say an ankle fracture, abdominal pain, something like that, will go to a specific part and then patients with respiratory complaints can be put in the same area with the idea of separating the two specific complaints to help us care for COVID in patients and not spread infections as well as kind of streamline some of the care that we provide. The biggest limitation to that is that this is happening in an already busy ER, so how we can form walls and build things in space that's already being currently used for patients. Um, and then also using spaces that are not currently used for patients. So we in particular have retrofitted our auditorium to function as a huge triage space for these, these uh, patients that may be coming in, which has consisted of a lot of construction, a lot of walls, a lot of planning. Um, and we have been fortunate enough to kind of plan ahead of time because our surge of patients may be later than states like New York. So I think the big problem is number one, how do we separate spaces in the emergency department currently uh, to take care of these patients in this way? And then number two is how do we use spaces that are not for patient care um, in pandemics to accommodate for large surges in patient volume. I think the other thing that's really important to take into account with this is how we predict uh, patient surges better so that we know when we have to have these things in place um, and when we need to disrupt usual care um, to help guide us in terms of when we expect to see these large volumes of patients. We've up upstaffed our ER waiting for these surges. Um, there's some shifts that are slower than others. And so it would be probably really nice to be able to use specific objective data to help us decide when we're gonna see these surges or um, put up these various walls in different parts of the emergency department as we spoke about. So how do you utilize all the specific data that's coming in in real time from various sources help us as a healthcare system plan for large um, presentations. Hi, my name is Adam Landman. I'm an emergency physician and the chief information and digital innovation officer at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is part of Partners Healthcare. We are a large academic integrated healthcare delivery system in Boston, Massachusetts. During these extraordinary times, I am prouder than ever to be part of this incredible team 
working around the clock to ensure we can continue providing high quality care to current patients while preparing for the possible future patients. Just like healthcare organizations across the globe, we have come together with great purpose and will ultimately prevail. Brigham and Women's Hospital has co-hosted three previous hackathons with MIT Hacking Medicine and seen extraordinarily positive outcomes, including new connections, new ideas, products, and even a few successful companies. We hope to build on these successes this weekend, helping solve COVID-19 challenges. It is amazing to see the tremendous interest from across the world to participate in this weekend long virtual event. I wanna thank each of you for your dedication and time. With your generous support, we can work together to help address some of the most pressing challenges during this global public health emergency. Shortly, you will hear directly from Partners Healthcare clinicians, staff, researchers, and leaders about some of the complex challenges we are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you again for your commitment this weekend to finding novel solutions that will ultimately help patients and healthcare workers across the world. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Hi everyone, my name is Sherry Yu. I'm one of the Deland Fellows in the Hospital Administration at Brigham and Women. I'm also a dermatologist by training. I've been part of the logistics section of Instant Command at Brigham and have been working on PPE conservation and innovation during this time. As you all know, during a crisis, communication and coordination of efforts are vital in ensuring that we keep everyone safe. Mass General Brigham recently moved to an all-user mask policy, and because of the constraints on our traditional supply chain, it's important for us to make sure that we have efficient distribution of things like procedural masks, N95s, uh, yellow gowns, and other cr critical items. Most recently in Australia, they developed vending machines to distribute PPE, and I'm hoping that you are all able to think creatively about a solution that requires minimal personnel to be able to distribute individually packaged items. I'm also looking for help in how we manage our supply in an automated process. Currently, it's a manual input to count the items that we have on hand daily, which takes a, a large amount of effort from many people. We also want to be able to collaborate with our community because I know so many of you are creative in many ways in order to make sure that we are able to res respond appropriately to the needs of the hospital. Thanks again for all of your willingness to help us solve these challenges and can't wait to hear the results. Hello, I'm Tavinda Full, Director of Partners Community Health Reporting and Compliance. I'm sure we can all identify with feeling very overwhelmed by all the information that comes across to us through various channels regarding COVID-19. It can be hard to know what's the most accurate information, what's the most up-to-date information, and what information is going to be most relevant for you where you are. Imagine feeling that way and not having regular or good access to the internet, to a phone, to a TV, uh, or to materials and information that are available in the language that you feel most comfortable in. Add to that that you might have a visual uh, or hearing or other disability that precludes you from interacting with the more traditional ways of deploying information. What would be really useful in this very critical time would be a very innovative, but simple and clear way to display um, important information related to COVID-19, related to resources available to people who are maybe suffering from not being able to access food or not being able to access transportation um, in ways that are accessible and consumable for them. It's a huge challenge um, it's something that I think has to happen at local levels, but any type of resource that could help to allow that information to come together in a real time accessible way would be invaluable and critical at this time. One of the biggest challenges that we're grappling with right now, um, very specific to our lower income 
patients as well as community residents who um, may also be our patients is um, accessibility to broadband or internet service. Um, there are definitely things in the news around companies like Comcast and others giving you know, a few months free or some level of discount. There's some government sponsored programs that do that. Um, unfortunately, with many of those programs, one, they're limited, two, they require that um, any eligible members provide some form of payment up front so that after the free time, uh, folks are automatically charged. Um, and oftentimes the service that's actually provided is not provided at, at enough of a discount. Um, really free is the discount that is needed. Um, but even if it is um, offered at a discount, the, uh, the rates at which or the speed, the internet speed is not sufficient to do you know, really simple telephonic or internet based appointments, which is what primarily this would be used for. So some way that we could think about deploying uh, Wi Fi free internet free Wi Fi hotspots that are in closed protected areas ways that we could somehow share broadband services so that somebody who didn't have access to it could somehow access to it. I have no idea how this would happen. But broadband and internet service for people who cannot afford it and, and really aren't going to be helped by just having, you know, one or two months. Uh, many of our patients are chronically ill. This is going to go on for quite a while. I think we all know that. Um, so some sustainable way that um, internet service can be provided free for the purposes of telemedicine would be absolutely critical during this time. Good luck. Hi, I'm Catherine Schiavone. I'm a primary care physician at Mass General Hospital and a population health fellow at Partners Healthcare. Thank you for participating in this hackathon to help us find COVID solutions for vulnerable patients. Recently, many frontline clinicians at Mass General have noticed a disproportionate number of patients being admitted for COVID from the communities of Chelsea, East Boston, Malden, Everett, and Revere. Early numbers show that over 40% of our admitted patients with COVID are from these communities versus about 17% of the regular inpatient medicine population. Clinicians are particularly concerned because these communities are home to some of our most vulnerable patient populations, including many recent immigrants and people who speak languages other than English. In addition, patients in these communities often live in tight housing conditions or share housing with other families, making it difficult for them to effectively self quarantine to prevent getting COVID or to isolate themselves if they develop symptoms. In addition, it's also difficult for these patients to access resources due to lack of transportation, financial barriers or concerns about insurance or immigration status. We're asking your help to help geographically identify clusters of cases and using this information to deploy resources to these vulnerable communities, including those with multiple language needs. This is particularly important to help stop the spread of COVID in these vulnerable communities and to decrease the number of patients with severe disease being admitted to the hospital. Thank you for your help. Good luck. Hi everyone, I am Bryn Cole. I'm the Director of Programming with the VHA Innovators Network. And later on, we'll hear from Dr. Amanda Purnell. She's a Senior Innovation Fellow with the VHA Innovation Ecosystem. And we are really excited, if that's the word, to pitch this uh, opportunity to you all. Um, so the way that we see it is uh, we have a vision problem and a signal problem. There is so much noise right now. People are petrified and know only that they need to stay in their homes as much as they can to limit the spread of the virus. But here's the thing. At some point, we are going to be asked to emerge. Some people will have immunity and others will not. People will still be fearful to interact with each other. We will be afraid of catching the virus if we have not uh, been previously and definitively diagnosed with it. And we will be fearful of spreading it to others, not knowing if they have had it or not. The Dalai Lama said, uh, I bet you didn't think you're going to get a Dalai Lama quote in here, but here you are. Uh, in order to carry a positive action, we must 
develop here a positive vision. So here is our vision for you. We want your help in devising a solution that helps to identify people who are immune to the virus. People who may not have ever gone to see their doctor, or ever gone to their healthcare system. Maybe they thought it was just a cold. We want your help in devising an at home solution so that people can know that they are immune to the virus and that they're free to go out and help others. They can volunteer in the healthcare system. They can help support seniors. They can work with children. So we need not only a system that identifies immunity, but also some way of signaling to others that they are immune. So it's up to you to figure out what that system would look like, but we think that you are up to that challenge. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Danielle Krakora and I'm one of the fellows for the VHA Innovation Ecosystem. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our challenges and I look forward to working with you all over the next couple of days. Thanks and take care. Hello, I would like to share with you our challenge. My name is Amanda Purnell. I'm a Senior Innovation Fellow for the VHA Innovation Ecosystem and I want to tell you about the problem of the impact of delaying care. So one of the concerns we have that we'd love to hear your solutions for is what can we do to help those people whose not emergency care is delayed to both think about the stacking up of health care that will occur once we return to more normal operations and also the physical and mental health impacts and how we might mitigate those physical and mental health impacts for our veterans so that during this time when we're providing health care in a different way, we can also be connected to and paying attention to those people who aren't coming into our medical centers and trying to reduce the impact of the change in our care at this time. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Danielle Krakora and I'm one of the fellows for the VHA Innovation Ecosystem. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our challenges and I look forward to working with you all over the next couple of days. Thanks and take care. Hello again, this is Amanda Purnell and I have one last challenge. As you know, Veteran suicide is a main clinical priority for us within the Veterans Healthcare Administration. And we know that social isolation is a predictive factor for individuals who are at risk for harming themselves. And so we want your help in figuring out how can we and what are the many ways that we might help our veterans who are using the VA, even veterans who are not using the VA, so that during this time of social distancing, that we are attending to their mental health and making sure that we keep our veterans safe in all the ways that we can keep them safe during this time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Philip Fan, Alonso and Virginia Decker Professor at Johns Hopkins University. I lead a team of researchers in psychiatry, computer science, and management science to study mental health in the time of COVID. Concerns around mental health during this very stressful time can be divided into two broad categories. The first are related to providers, clinicians, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, who have to deal with patients on a daily basis, many of whom are distressed with the COVID-19 syndrome. Uh, a number of these concerns include moral distress, 
that may be experienced by clinicians uh, as they're triaging and having to allocate staff's resources and making decisions around which patients to treat first. Increased exhaustion, fatigue, and depression by being on the job oftentimes uh, for much longer hours than they normally would. Increased anxiety due to concern for patients and their own families, especially with the uncertainty over the duration of the crisis. And concerns about workplace safety, such as the lack of personal protection equipment or the inadequacy of the measures that have been used to protect both patients uh, that may not have COVID-19, but are exposed potentially because they're in the same hospitals and of course to providers. The second category of issues uh, that we are looking at um, have to do with patients and their families. So uh, as we know, uh, especially patients uh, with mental health conditions uh, going into the crisis may experience increased duress due to stay at home orders and job losses. Uh, the home environment itself uh, may not be conducive to mental health. So patients or individuals uh, who live with uh, abusive significant others, substance abusers and so on, uh, are now increasing, uh, experience increased exposure to this environment. Uh, patients with pre-existing mental health conditions such as depression, bipolar disorders or anxiety may themselves be at increased risk because of the uncertainty uh, and the fear that is associated with this condition, the syndrome. Caregivers at home who now deal with patient families are suffering from mental health conditions, oftentimes not at an increased intensity because of stable orders, where before uh, they might actually be uh, able to benefit from care outside the home. Um, the potential impact of COVID-19 on provider and patients uh, could be uh, things like increased suicide ideation uh, and acting out. We know that during times of economic distress, that suicide rates tend to go up. And we expect that uh, in, in this time, that is likely to happen. Uh, other things that might uh, be an outcome of the current COVID-19 situation could be the exacerbation or triggering uh, that is in patients that may not have had such conditions but begin to develop these conditions uh, in chronic health uh, related to uh, depression, anxiety, anger, fear, hopelessness. Uh, and also the exacerbation or triggering of substance abuse and other kinds of abusive behaviors towards others. So these are of course particularly concerning because they might be more long lasting uh, than um, the uh, uh, clinical uh, fallout uh, or the uh, physiological fallout uh, from COVID. And then finally, past research has shown that's a correlation between anxiety and a diet of bad news. So we are now experiencing uh, like nothing before, 24 seven a constant drumming of a repetitive news cycle and flood of social media, some of which are perhaps designed to attract attention related to the And we know that there is a correlation between the deterioration of mental health and bad news in general, but this steady diet, uh, intense diet of bad news uh, and uh, the constant exposure to COVID-19 related means may actually have uh, increased uh, and more and more. So thank you very much for uh, putting um, your efforts towards helping us solve these problems and we very much look forward to hearing from you. This is Sarah Wilkie. I'm a project manager with um, Partners Quality and Patient Experience. And the problem I'm going to be talking about is loneliness for patients inside the hospital. So with the COVID pandemic, the hospitals have implemented a pretty strict no visitor policy. It means that patients who are on the inpatient floors are really isolated from friends and family who would be visiting them otherwise. A lot of patients um, are experiencing loneliness right now, and one way that they might be able to fill that gap is by FaceTiming and using WhatsApp or, or um, making phone calls on their phone or iPad or laptop so they can digitally engage with their friends and family. 
However, a lot of the low income patients who come into the hospital won't have cell phones or smartphones to be able to use this technology to engage with their friends and family. There will also be another group of low income patients who will have a smartphone, but they won't have enough data to use applications like FaceTime. So one creative idea would be to try to figure out if any of the iPads or computers or other devices that are on the hospital floors can be used to allow some of these patients to um, do things like FaceTime their friends and family while they're in the hospital alone and can't have any visitors. The problem I'll be talking about is self-isolation for home the homeless population. So right now there's a major problem where homeless patients are going in to be tested in between the time that we know if they are positive or not, they need to be self-isolating so that they potentially are not spreading it if they are decided to be positive. There is a major problem of not having enough shelter beds. Um, even if the patient was able to get into a shelter, they wouldn't necessarily be able to self-isolate. So I think the biggest problem is creating a space for homeless patients to stay where they're able to self-isolate, they're able to have a bed and shelter, um, but in a way that if they are positive for COVID, they're not interacting with other people and might be spreading further. One example is Boston Health Care for the Homeless was able to set up tents. Um, a lot of other across the country organizations are talking about how they can use hotels or dorms or other spaces um, such as convention centers to set up um, additional capacity for self-isolation for this population. Hi, this is Sarah Welke and I'll be talking about food insecurity and access to food for different vulnerable populations. So the major thing here is um, low income patients, elderly and children, um, and getting them access to food. So for low income patients, the main thing is making sure that they have um, money to get food. They may be losing their jobs or getting cut down on hours. So paying for food probably is the first challenge. Um, services like SNAP doesn't cover home, secure, um, home delivery and grocery services. Then the elderly, in particular, um, the main challenge with food insecurity there is them leaving their house to be able to go get food. They're particularly susceptible to COVID um, and, um, and it might be risky for them to go to the grocery store. They probably um, may be limited in mobility, maybe um, homebound. So bringing food to them would be um, probably the best um, solution. And then with children, similarly, if their parents are um, experiencing some financial concerns right now related to COVID, it may be a challenge for them to be getting food. Um, also, children who are not going to school right now are not getting provided meals um, that they would ordinarily be getting. So I think with those three populations, um, there are similar challenges where they need to find creative ways to get food and um, ways to get it delivered directly to them. We talked about the home visits and AIDS problem that we submitted. So there's a couple of problems here. I think first is for the, the elderly patients um, who are used to having AIDS come into their home and provide them care with activities of daily living. The AIDS are likely going to need to reduce hours um, during the pandemic to um, try to prevent spread. So first of all, there's the population of these elderly patients who need help at home who may not be getting that help anymore. Then additionally, um, for the home aides, they are not gonna get paid unless they provide the services. 
So for those staff, the first problem is that they may be experiencing financial um, issues as a result of not being able to provide um, the services. Then if they are worried about their finances, they may continue to work through symptoms because they need to keep getting paid. All right, I think that was the last of our videos. Um, so at this time, you know, we really want you guys to be thinking about some of these problems that were uh, talked about by our clinical partners and all of our clinical partners will be on hand throughout the weekend for you guys to be able to interact with and go more in depth on you know, what they've described through these very short videos. Um, and I think, you know, make good use of that time. Uh, they obviously have very limited amount of time to spend with us, uh, as many of them are healthcare providers themselves um, working on the front lines. Um, but um, next we'll have a couple of closing speakers for this part of the evening um, to really kind of help put in the framework of you know, what you should be focusing on this weekend. Uh, how do you, uh, what you should hope to have by the end of the weekend but also be thinking, what are you gonna do after this weekend? How do you take what, you know, this initial team that you built together, this initial level concept and prototype and really give it some traction and build something that's robust that can have a meaningful impact uh, during uh, this crisis. So the next person up is John Bloom, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Podometrics. Uh, which was a uh, company that came out of MIT Hacking Medicine's I believe first or second uh, hackathon that we ever did. Uh, and so uh, I'll turn it over to John. Excellent. So hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, my name is John Bloom. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist by training and I'll, actually I'll get into that in a moment. If you wanna just click it to the next slide, I'll uh, tell a little bit of the story of what, what came out of our hackathon where it went and some of the things I've learned now that I've gotten to see probably 20, 30 hackathons over the past long while. So of course it always begins with a problem. Um, here we have a big one, but it's really about finding that right part of it that you think you can, you can address. The one that we went after was um, amputations due to diabetes, of the lower extremity. It's this problem, you know, we'd spend whole days in the operating room doing nothing but amputations, loss of a limb for something that again, shouldn't be happening. This is an interesting problem. And in my background prior to this, so um, anesthesia across the river, and then uh, um, coincidentally for how it applies uh, today and for back then, I was the global medical director of Covidian's respiratory and monitoring solutions, meaning I was the medical director for uh, the world's largest mechanical ventilator company and uh, for monitoring systems, trying to think about uh, you know, what, what types of signal we're looking for that we saw some good data, we could either encourage a good event to occur or prevent a bad one from occurring. So this was an interesting problem. As soon as somebody said foot ulcers and amputations, um, we were all hooked. Five of us sat down at the table and uh, we went to work. So next, next slide. This is the, the, only, the only photo that survived the entire event, which again, none of us really realized what this weekend was gonna do to our lives. And I kind of like this photo, you know, this, this is as high tech as we were getting. I think it's about a 2009 or 10 MacBook Pro. We got this flip book and on there. I can see at the bottom, I don't know if my cursor can even show, but we got customer. I think we got some insole. It's either physiology or pathophysiology, one of the ologies. And we were trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's really going on here? What was the real problem? And, and like you're gonna find there, you might get fooled to solve a bigger problem, but there's really a smaller piece of it. That if you crack that piece, you really break open the whole part. For us, a lot of it was engagement. How do you get this patient the patient who's at risk here, who's overwhelmed by their healthcare, how can you build in habit and get them to use a system uh, uh, consistently day after day for a very long period in time? Next slide. So this is uh, my still my favorite slide I've ever gotten to help put together. I can only claim, I think, a couple of the icons here. And this was our solution at the end of the hackathon. It was a feedback loop, right? Could we just look for some signal? And if we saw it, could we you know, sort of fill in the feedback loop and do some sort of change to prevent the badness from occurring. 
I like this slide also because it's a terrible idea. This is an awful idea. We have, uh, um, we put in like everything that was hip. We have like a cloud in there. We have a, an, uh, some Bluetooth, so you got some wearables. We, we have, I still don't, I still remember why. We have like a Bluetooth um, headset. I don't know why that's there. We basically try to figure out like, what, what can we do to, to try to attack this? One of the major parts for this slide though is even though an idea can be terrible, I think we heard it earlier. I think Bill Letta talked about it. Um, a little bit of grit and keep work, you know, good team and, and continue to work on it you can actually solve real problems with it. So even though we started off, I think on a, a, a pretty uh, bad foot, well, no pun intended, but um, we got to a good spot. So next slide. So this is the team. We, we had no idea what, what was ahead of us doing a startup. We were, we were still smiling pretty, pretty, pretty heavily right here. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it was right outside of uh, MIT campus. Um, uh, next slide. So what did we end up doing? So, Ultimately, we needed to get signal on a routine daily basis. And we had to build in habit, we had to build in workflow. We ended up building a mat. Mat would go into a patient's home. You step on it for 20 seconds a day. That's all you have to do, go on with the rest of your life. And then we capture now two full dimensional thermograms of the feet, this thermal signal. That goes to the, excuse me, the cloud in a HIPAA compliant and secure fashion. And then using machine learning, we can look for subtle signals in that temperature data set that actually is saying a wound is coming and that we can prevent this, this thing from happening. Um, we ended up putting a study out, uh, by the way, working a lot with the VA, an unbelievable partner for us, that we can detect 97% of foot ulcers about five weeks before they happened. And now fast forward today, um, which is crazy to think, we're the leading care management company for amputation prevention. Um, I have to anonymize it for purposes of this discussion, but we've engaged now a number of the top five health plans in the United States including probably the most important one, which again is the US Department of Veterans Affairs. It's an interesting organization to work for, especially for COVID-19, right? They have a higher rates of comorbidities. Um, they also serve as in many ways, the backup um, hospital system for the nation. So it's a great place for us to really think about, you know, where can we deliver care? Where can we have uh, uh, an ability to impact? Because it impacts uh, a much larger population in the United States. And then excitingly, just came out today, so I had to sneak it in there. Uh, um, one of the top five pairs is submitting our landmark paper. Um, it's either today or tomorrow um, to show our reductions in inpatient stays, outpatient visits, and amputations. So it should be a, a big study for us. Um, we'll be excited to get that up. Uh, next slide. So um, yeah, couple couple thoughts. Uh, how to build go from zero to a company as quick as possible or in this case, zero to an implemented idea as quick as possible. Um, couple thoughts. One is normally you do these in one big room and hacking in one room is hard. It's gonna be really interesting to do this now remotely for a bunch of reasons. You're gonna to need to be able to have uh, breakouts. We're gonna to have to have deep dives into certain sections and yet you have to be all coordinated together. So figuring out the right cadence or how you wanna do that I think is gonna be paramount. And also you have to prepare or protect it against isolation. It's sometimes easy for everyone to sort of break off and start to research on their own. And the very problem we're dealing with with, with everyone working um, isolated away can, can manifest here. So making some sort of way that you're all checking with each other and sort of still having a common direction and that everything is coordinated, I think will be absolutely key. And then embrace the chaos because it's gonna be a bit of a crazy mess for 48 hours, part of the enormous fun that you're gonna get to do. Uh, and I'm very, very serious about that. Um, two, is this is a heck of a place to be. Um, this is an amazing network we have out here. Um, so definitely leverage the MIT network, the global network, even just in the local area. It's, it's sort of like seven degrees of Kevin Bacon between some of the mentors and some of the partners here. You could probably get to the Pope or Bill Gates within you know, four or five emails. So definitely leverage that hard. The, the MIT and COVID-19, you put those two things together and you can unlock a lot of doors. So be aggressive on, if you need information, you want to get in front of somebody or get their thoughts, get out there and try to get to talk to those people. It's an unbelievable network here. Um, you're also going to have this unbelievable list of mentors to get to steal. I've gotten to do this a number of times. And I think one of the things that companies will have or groups will have to figure out is balancing that. You have a lot of work to get done. And then you have some of these people are going to come in and give advice. And in many ways, they might come in you, know, you gotta be careful for them to keep coming in and preventing you from continuing to drive forward. You know, each one of you is gonna be the CEO of your company. And just like a bunch of consultants, you're, if you have too many different views, you might get distracted in multiple directions. 
I think one of the biggest things you can do is just make a bet and keep going forward. Try to resist the temptation to keep pivoting over and over again. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect this time around. It's really about working with team, making decisions, moving forward, and that constantly changing direction is just be mindful of that as you hear a lot of great ideas. Take it in, consider it, but really decide how applicable it is. And then the golden rule of all consultants, ideally you give them a question before they, they, they come over as opposed to letting them sort of freely give uh, a wisdom that may or may not be perfectly productive. Um, probably one of the most important ones I think is repurpose anything you can. Our system was built off, off the shelf components. Nothing we did was tep very technologically novel, yet we were able to fundamentally solve a problem, which was a big thing. Uh, I think it was Steve Jobs who had said, good artists create, great artists steal. And in many, there's a lot of parts to that. So you, know, you don't have to be the ones inventing things. Some of the things are right there and they're immediately impactful to COVID-19. For example, there's a group out of the VHA Innovation Ecosystem. Beth Ripley had an idea. She's sitting with a capability with 3D printing, knows how to use it, sees that there's a problem with not enough masks, and instantly she can apply that technology and have an enormous impact on the clinicians at a site, potentially across the nation. So it's, you don't necessarily have to think be too crazy in the, in the technologies or, or ideas you're putting out. Many times it's just sitting right next to you and you gotta think about the best way to deploy it. And then, oh, it should be number five, but it's probably, yeah, number one, it's probably the most important one is just don't start working, stop working on it after the weekend. That's critical because what comes out of here is gonna be a great idea, but it's that next mile that makes a difference to patient care. Um, next slide, which I think is my last. So I, I wanna focus, they're all number one, that's probably a good thing, uh, to focus on, on that last point. Innovation has impact, invention doesn't. An idea goes nowhere. It doesn't impact anything. You need to be able to innovate, which means get it out and commercialize it or get it into practice. Um, I think that's critical. You owe it to me, you owe it to my folks who are sitting at home. If you have an idea and it's a great idea, please get out there and do something with it so that all of us, the world can get impacted by some of the solutions that are coming out here today. Don't, do not stop hacking after this event is over. Number two is be prepared for it. Ideas can really take off quickly. It's part of the excitement of it, and you're gonna get a chance firsthand to really shape how this disease is progressing in the world. And lastly, like literally, what does it take to change the world? In my mind, it's three things. One is, is relentless focus, trying to make sure you're really, really key on exactly what you wanna get done. Two is dedicated time. It won't just happen. You gotta put in the time to that, for the 48 hours here and afterwards, and then grit. You're gonna be hit with a ton of obstacles this weekend, afterwards, that's part of the fun. It's the determination, it's the, the, the grit that will get you through it to get the, the world to be able to see the things you have. I am thrilled to get to see some of the, the, the solutions that come out, some of the potential companies that come out of it. We need that help, we need you. And to see, uh, um, yeah, what ultimately is the impact of this event, which we're just now gonna start to see uh, over the next hour or two is gonna be uh, um, inspiring. And again, it's an honor to get a chance to, uh, to participate. Um, please feel free to buzz me again, my, uh, mechanical ventilation or monitoring systems. Um, there's a lot of really smart people affiliated with this group. Grab them, steal them, get the wisdom, and uh, keep jamming. Thanks a ton. Thanks, John. Great to you know, really put things into perspective and really what you can accomplish out of just one weekend, um, putting your heads together with a bunch of other smart people. Um, and. Next, we have uh, Andre Polito, who is uh, one of our former co-directors of MIT Hacking Medicine, uh, and you know herself also spun out a company at one of these hackathons, uh, Smart Scheduling, that was ultimately bought by Athena Health. But she's been also involved with a lot of actually our partners that you've heard from today, and our other partners as well, having been um, involved with the Brigham I Hub and then being at with the VA's Innovators Network as well. Uh, and she's now at uh, Cornell. Um, and I will turn it over to you, Andrea. Well, hooray times a million, giant virtual hugs to the 1,400 people on the line right now. I'm just so deeply honored to be here with all of you. Pee my pants happy for the impact that you're going to be creating this weekend. So thank you all so much for being here and, and volunteering your time and dedicating your time. And, and if you go to the next slide, just to highlight the point that's been made is there is just a wonderful group of partners here that can help you get to impact. 
And the way that we all get to impact is by working together. As John just said, we leverage existing ideas and then we start getting them into practice and testing them and trying them out. But lean on this amazing network of folks because it truly does take a village. Um, the reason this novel coronavirus um, it exists because it's new, and so it requires also new ways of approaching this a problem. And so lean on this network to get to impact um, and listen to the people at the front lines and the people being impacted. And don't just create things for the sake of creating things, but create them so they actually solve real needs. So if you go to the next slide, I just want to share some quick examples of how the world has come together from diverse groups of people in the past to solve really, really hard, gnarly problems. And so this was mentioned earlier, actually, how World War I was one of the moments in time where we all came together to have goodness. And so you all keep doing this this weekend. So during World War I, which is when modern ambulances were invented, they were literally using horses and buggies. But then after one of the unfortunate battles, a group of volunteers came together, 32 of them, and they found these newfangled devices, cars, and they just brought the cars to the battlefield and started picking up um, the wounded. And so after this incident, they saw, wow, there's a huge opportunity here to get to practice faster and so we can get people from the battlefield to hospitals. And so they put out a call across universities worldwide. And 48 universities had student volunteers fly to Europe so that they could become the first ambulance corps. So just know that this approach of bringing people together from across the world to solve really hard, gnarly problems in healthcare um, has been done before, and you are all part of that. Um, antiseptic. This uh, came about um, during World War I because unfortunately there were um, a phenomenal number of amputations happening. And so uh, what was causing 70% of the amputations wasn't the actual wound itself, but it was from the infections from the wound. Um, so doctors and scientists from across the world, from England and France and New York City came together and they found a way to deliver antiseptic to prevent these amputations from happening as much as possible. And last but not least, I know you just heard from our uh, anesthesiologists and residents but new ways of delivering anesthesia came out of World War I. And a, nurses and doctors from Cleveland came together with folks from France to deliver this so that it could help save lives and help improve uh, the practice of medicine. Um, so if you go to the next slide, what's common across all three of these examples is the fact that they started with this deep need. And the fact that people came together, stepped up, came to the plate, which is exactly what all of you are doing here this weekend, and they came together to solve this deep need. And they listened to the people at the front lines, and they came in and rolled up their sleeves and made a difference. They threw out the rule book, and they came together. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, for a virtual uh, raise of hands, and I think you can do it via Zoom, um, my favorite movie of all time is Apollo 13, and it's one of the reasons why I became an engineer. And I'm sure many of you remember this moment from the movie where they said, um, we can only use these materials on the table to solve the oxygen scrubber problem, and we need to make this fit into this. And so that's what's happening right now on the front lines of COVID-19 is the fact that we only have a certain amount of materials and we need to use what existing infrastructure materials teams we have to solve this problem right now. No excuses. I was on the phone yesterday with one of um, my close friends who's a provider out in Oregon, and they are taking wards of hospitals that have been decommissioned decades ago that have not been in use, and they're getting them into practice right now. They're throwing out the rule book because they need to think differently and take action right now. And so that's why you all are here to do that. And so if you go to the next slide, I want to share uh, another example. So we've heard from folks of the VA system. Um, so the VA actually launched one of the first, if not the first, electronic medical record system. And there was a group of computer programmers in the late 70s and early 80s that were literally hacking at their own individual VA medical centers from Boston to Oklahoma to across the country. And th what they were doing is they were sitting side by side with frontline care providers and they were listening to them. And then they were building alongside of these frontline care providers. And when people told them no, they kept moving forward because they knew this was the right thing for veterans and their families. And how this came together, believe it or not, was a weekend. They all flew to D.C. on their own dime, and they got into a hotel room, and they literally started integrating this patchwork of code from across the VA system together. 
And on Monday, they pitched it to a U.S. senator. And that is how one of the nation's first electronic health record medical systems was born over a weekend by a group of hackers coming together, which is exactly what all of you are doing here this weekend. And then I think I have one more example. If you go to the next slide, uh, is the, the story of ironclad battleships. So I'm a huge nerd in history, if you can't tell. Um, but, you know, the government and healthcare, both two very bureaucratic systems, are not often known for thinking fast. But I will tell you, when there's a need and a group of amazing people come together, things can happen quickly across the world. And this is one example. Um, there was a huge need for a new approach with battleships. And ironclad battleships, so iron lining battleships, was this phenomenon, but no one could get it together. So someone stepped up, and within six months, they went from the idea of an ironclad battleship to it actually getting deployed in battle. And so when people actually come together, good things can happen because everyone's on the same page because we understand the problem to solve. And again, that's what you all are here to do this weekend. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I just want to um, tell one quick story of, of hackathons to build on what John said. Um, so I was part of a hackathon where a physician, Gabby Belfort, who you can see his picture on the screen, came together at hackathon and he pitched the problem of no-shows. One in five patients tend to no-show for their medical appointments. And he said, there's got to be a better way. Brilliant engineers, designers, scientists, please help me out here. And so we came together at the hackathon and we came up with a prototype. Uh, we didn't win the hackathon. We didn't bring at home any big accolades, but we came together from our diverse disciplines to solve this problem. After the hack, we continued moving forward. We went to frontline care providers. We went to the scheduling ninjas that are scheduling appointments, and we listened to them, and we iterated. We were often wrong, but we were constantly listening and iterating. And so whether it's this weekend or after this weekend, you need to be constantly listening to the frontline care providers, the patients, the people that are impacted by this problem, and then just not giving up, but listening to them and evolving based on their feedback to get to impact as soon as possible. Lean on the partners that are as part of this community to get your ideas to impact to solve these problems facing our world today. Um, and just to tell you the end of the story, um, because we were so focused on listening, eventually we did sell the company to a health IT company called Athena Health, one of the partners here today. Um, so again, lean on the partners. It takes a village for healthcare innovation. But as Bill talked about, this isn't just about healthcare. This is about workforce innovation. This is about mental health care as well. And so think differently uh, about how you're approaching these problems. Um, so if you keep moving forward, Freddie, um, I just want to leave you with uh, one next slide. So I just want to leave you with some comments on what is your goal by the end of this weekend? So as John talked about is focus on the problem to solve and be just relentless about that problem and bring in the stakeholders and users from the clinical partners and listen to them. They're going to be really busy, so if you can't get time with them, that's okay. Read about them. Watch what's happening at the front line. See if you can observe it and practice by seeing what's out there. And truly solve and understand the problem before you move forward with building any solutions. And then once you understand that problem, don't just build technology for technology's sake. As Bill said, it could be a new process. It could be a new pathway. The solution is often not new technology. Um, the picture you see here on the right is actually um, the very first prototype of PillPack, which years later got sold to Amazon for a billion dollars. And as you can see here, there's no newfangled gadgetry or mobile health apps or anything. It was a box but they thought very deeply about what that box and experience looks like from the patient and stakeholders perspective. And that's what you all need to do this weekend. And then um, you need to be thinking towards the future, the near future of how you can get to impact. Don't let good be the enemy of perfect. Get that solution out there to impact so they can sol start solving problems as soon as possible, but also don't just get out there to add noise to an overwhelmed system. Think very clearly about how you deploy it in collaboration with stakeholders so it can solve their needs as soon as possible. Um, and with that, uh, please go forth, solve these problems, and, and I just thank you for all that you're doing and thanks to all of our amazing partners. Thanks, Andrea. That was really great inspirational uh, talk for the, team, for the participants. Um, and I think really, again, speaking to 
you guys have a unique opportunity here because of the really wealth of partners and the whole ecosystem coming together to support you. Um, they're here in, you know, providing mentorship during the event. They're here providing resources and access to platforms and APIs and data sets. Um, but as was mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it wasn't, it's not just about what's hap going to happen during this weekend. Um, we have as much of an emphasis and investment in what happens after the hackathon. So all of these partners that you see listed here have also committed to uh, committing their resources, committing their expertise, committing um, their people towards uh, continuing that journey with you to get it to implementing these solutions and having an impact where it's meaningful in the lives of patients and the lives of clinicians um, amidst uh, all that's happening right now. So with that, we're going to transition a little bit more into more of the logistical and programmatic aspect of uh, what you should expect to see out of this hackathon. Um, MIT Hacking Medicine has, of course, been doing hackathons for nearly 10 years now, as uh, John was there during some of the earlier days, and so was Andrea. Um, but we'll start with a short video about Hacking Medicine. MIT Hacking Medicine is a very unique organization. We bring together a diverse set of people from a range of backgrounds, whether it's engineering, medicine, advocacy, even the patient population. And we empower them to work together to identify needs in healthcare and try to invent plausible solutions. At MIT, we call this way of solving challenges hacking. When I say hacking, I don't mean what you might think, a bunch of coders sitting around trying to cause security leaks or illegally breaking into databases. To us, hacking means using a creative or unexpected method to solve a challenge. Hacking is in our DNA. In 2012, a group of passionate students realized that the traditional hackathon model could be applied to healthcare, specifically using design thinking to create changes rather than focusing on technical or hard coding skills. Thus, MIT Hacking Medicine was born pioneering the healthcare hackathon model. Now people are building new healthcare ventures rather than just gadgets or lines of code. During our hacking marathons, which last two to three days, we bring together people from across the healthcare spectrum to attack real challenges. Our health hackathons are different from other hackathons out there. You don't have to be a coder to participate. In fact, we insist on an interdisciplinary approach. Attendees can be patients, nurses, doctors, researchers, engineers, developers, insurance specialists, politicians, or advocates. Together, they work on real user needs and address actual pain points in healthcare. And they invent real, viable business solutions. At MIT, our process for hackathons is simple. Break it down, build it up, and make it better. In essence, we take a problem, break it down, and find its root causes and key players. We then build up a solution to hack the problem. And finally, we iterate and optimize to make it better. So what does that actually look like? There are six stages of a hackathon. Pitch, mix, hack, feedback, iterate, and present. These six stages typically occur over the course of a weekend, but can be compressed into a shorter timeline. So does all this hacking really work? Well, our events are very popular now. Every spring, we have our flagship event at MIT, the Grand Hack. We also partner with organizations to host hacks around the world. We've sponsored with major players from the clinical world, medical and tech industries, and nonprofits alike. And we've now taken our model to over 20 countries and created many successful international partnerships. At Hacking Medicine, we provide opportunities for people to network with experts and passionate individuals in healthcare. Come join us. Kickstart solutions, explore new ventures, and impact the local ecosystem. So at Hacking Medicine, really our mission is to democratize healthcare innovation. And I think that's really apparent by all of you guys that are here with us tonight, that it's taking everybody and anyone who has had an interface with the healthcare system that can have an impact uh, within this space and really help pioneer the healthcare hackathon model. As we mentioned, hacking is not about gaining unauthorized access, at least not the way we think about it. For us, hacking is about a creative application of ingenuity, uh, really thinking about new ways to solve problems uh, that the traditional world wouldn't uh, otherwise address. 
as most of you know, a hackathon is uh, made up of a hack and a marathon, uh, really in emphasizing on uh, teamwork, innovation, and really this intense time period to really break down those barriers and really focus on letting the best ideas rise to the top. And of course, hacking has been always in the DNA at MIT. Um, and every year there's always some kind of a hack and the most uh, recent ones that was probably made the news was when we turned the Great Dome into Captain America's shield last year. But as just to reiterate, um, with our healthcare hackathons, even though we have plenty of engineers and coders with us tonight, um, there's other parts of it that are just as important. You guys need to build a very interdisciplinary teams. Uh, I know we've received a lot of requests of people asking, well, I've already got a preformed team coming into this hackathon. Um, you know, how do I build out the team out, uh, to be more diverse? And I really encourage you guys during the problem pitching sessions, during interacting with as many other people as you can, because you need those diverse backgrounds and perspectives, not just in the co-development of the solution, but even at the very beginning when you're thinking about what is actually the problem uh, and approaching it from multiple angles. And again, our focus really is about making this very much a problem-centric um, design and really focusing on what the actual user needs are. And then the last part that we also want you guys to focus on is really the feasibility of the business viability. This is really important. Um, because you know, there's a lot of, for example, good research that happens in labs that can be clinically or scientifically uh, proven to be more significant. But if it, they haven't thought about how this is going to integrate into existing workflows, into the existing infrastructure, uh, thinking about who's going to be the end user, who's going to be prescribing that solution, uh, who's going to be buying it, then you know, it has just as little chance of getting implemented if they haven't taken all those things, all those factors into account. As mentioned, we've now done our hackathons all over the globe and uh, over almost 200 now, over 80 cities and 32 countries. And just, you know, to remind you guys, you guys are making up representation from nearly 90 countries, I think, uh, across the globe. And I think this really speaks to the power of what you guys can do this weekend. Um, and of course, talked about the meaningful impact of the companies that we have. You've heard some great stories from John and from Andrea, uh, real life stories. Um, and of course, some of the more successful companies that we've probably heard about has been uh, companies like PillPack. Um, so just to go into what does this weekend going to look like, just kind of go through the rough outlines of uh, what the healthcare hackathon looks like. So really, you know, we really want you guys to really think about the problem and really break that problem down. Um, usually, most of the problems that come to our hackathons are still on the order of trying to boil an ocean. And you really want to start figuring out, you know, what is the what are the subparts of the problem? Who are the stakeholders involved in that problem? How do you figure out what the incentives are for all those stakeholders? Align them up so that when you're building the solutions, you have all those uh, guiding principles in your head. And of course, the other part that we highly uh, emphasize on is to go through this very iterative process, uh, brainstorm for some solutions to address that pr uh, problem, iterate and continue to improve on it. You'll come to find it's a constant back and forth as you get more and more uh, trying to develop the solution. You'll hit a wall and you'll figure out that it's because you haven't defined the problem just quite right. And then you redefine it and then continue on that iteration process. Um, so roughly time-wise, uh, tonight, right after this, uh, we'll split up into 10 different rooms uh, along the tracks that uh, we have for these challenges. Uh, and we'll actually emulate problem pitching, uh, in which case, you know, each one of you will get a chance in 45 seconds to pitch the problem uh, that you're wanting to work on within these uh, tracks. And then there'll be an opportunity for you guys to then intermix, essentially be able to join each other's problem pitch cha Slack channels, uh, talk a little bit more deeply about the problem that you guys have pitched, and start forming teams around there. By tomorrow morning, you should be finalizing the teams uh, that you're putting together. Again, highly emphasizing on building an interdisciplinary team. You know, get the engineers, but get the scientists, the clinicians, get the user designers, the programmers all together on your team. And then most of Saturday, and through uh, Sunday morning um, will be your, the hacking period. And during this time, we'll bring together a wealth of 
not just resources and um, uh, from expertise from our partners, um, but a very, um, I think nearly over 200 mentors that will be coming in throughout the weekend, uh, following uh, all of those diverse stakeholder groups that we talked about earlier. And really pull on them, as John mentioned, uh, get that feedback, uh, push them hard on you know, the validity of what you're building and the solution that you're building. Uh, and if they can't give you an answer, get them to find you somebody who can. Uh, all of us have our own respective networks and groups of friends and colleagues that we can pull into these situations. And again, continue on this iteration process, literally up to the time that you present on Sunday afternoon. Um, so final presentations will be due at noon. Uh, again, all these times are in the Eastern time zone. So apologize ahead for everybody else who's on the other side of the world, um, but then the presentations will be on Sunday afternoon uh, as well. Um, so as mentioned, this is gonna be a little bit challenging doing it virtually. Uh, you won't get the luxury of feeling the uh, energy in the room and uh, being able to line up, but we'll be essentially going into these uh, Zoom rooms uh, while, uh, and essentially using the raise hand, uh, hand raising function for you to line up essentially virtually. Uh, to pitch your problem. Yeah. And next will be the mixing as I described earlier. And of course, the hacking period. Um, you know, we, one big change because we are uh, sourcing from a very global network towards this, um, might be pushing the boundaries in terms of uh, working really around the clock at this, uh, on this particular hackathon. And of course, that feedback period can't iterate enough um, really encourage you guys to be going on your second and your third and your fourth and your fifth iteration by the end of this weekend. Uh, you know, obviously spend enough due diligence um, to vet your idea, but don't spend too much time on it if you're hitting too many walls, um, because there's too many walls for a reason. Of course, continue to iterate in your final presentations on Sunday. So there'll be actually two practice pitch opportunities on Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning where the MIT team will be uh, listening and giving you feedback on those practice presentations. Uh, so don't you know, feel uh, over angst over uh, that just yet. We'll make sure to get you well prepared uh, for the judges for sure. But that is one important aspect of this too, that it's not just about building a solution out of it. You have to be able to communicate to us and to others about the importance of these problems and the importance and the rationale behind what you're building to solve those problems. So some general hack do's and don'ts, you know, obviously open yourself to crazy ideas, leave your job titles at the door, really seek those diverse teams, reach out for help, whether it's the organizing team or the, the mentors or the partners that we have on board throughout this weekend, uh, don't hesitate to do that. Um, fail fast and often, really this iterating and pivoting. I know John mentioned don't try to pivot too many times, but there is a fine balance between the two. Um, but definitely focus on the problem. Uh, if you're, you know, focus on the problem, centered around the problem, um, that's really the best way moving forward. And then, you know, build something and really there we mean take action and don't just sit around within your group, talk about ideas and just whiteboard ideas really go test those ideas, go to focus groups. If you can code, then build, you know, write up an app or a program. Uh, if you have access to other things to even wireframe, you know, just get the concepts out there so that you can start working with it in, in, in real time. Hack don'ts, um, definitely don't worry about patenting. So just as a reminder to all of the participants, uh, what comes out of this, these virtual hackathons is under the, open source license through the MIT license. Uh, and so it's really meant to help accelerate the uh, adopt, adoption of these ideas, the implementation of these ideas by our clinical partners. Um, and so obviously, we'll, you know, there'll be proper attribution, of course, to the original developers, but this is really about you know, the social good and trying to come up with really good solutions that will solve the most pressing needs today. Um, don't develop too broad of a solution. Uh, as we talked about, you know, really focus on the problem, but then also make sure that the solution you're building is addressing that specific problem and not related problems or not three different problems that just because you thought you could add some, add some bells and whistles to it um, to make it fancier, 
don't do that. Really go after the minimal viable product here. Don't be negative, don't be shy, and don't monopolize the conversation. Really bring, you know, if there is a shy person on your team, bring them out of their shell and really get them engaged in, in the process. Uh, and don't only talk. Again, really take action, try different ideas out, test them against the mentors, against others um, within the various tracks that are here. I mean, there's 1,500 of you uh, out here trying to build uh, solutions during this hackathon. So a good hack is based on a good story, and that's really tied to the problem that you're defining. Um, if you have to be able to communicate what's the importance of that problem and why it's impactful, that it meets a real need, and that this is you know, a common or a problem that's iterated and then a solution that you can continue to iterate on and test and scale. So with that, we're now, We go quickly into uh, the leg or for the next part, which will be going into our breakthroughs for problem pitching. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the those things so that way you can start thinking about how to frame the problems that you're already thinking about, um, and really that a clear and concise statement that describes symptoms or really the point point, and really think about it in quantifiable terms. And the reason we say this is so that you know, you start having essentially metrics that you can start measuring for when you implement your solution, you can say you've had an impact and you can quantify it. Uh, a well-defined problem segment really enables people to readily grasp and understand what you're trying to accomplish. And again, being that critical communication tool to help get buy-in and support from others. Uh, we talk about the five W's in defining the problems, the who, what, when, and where, and why. You know, who is this problem really affecting? Is it the patient? Is it the physician? Is it the nurse? Is it the hospital themselves? Um, really try to really describe what that actual problem is. What's the impact of that problem will be solved? Uh, what will happen if the problem's not solved? Uh, what are the potential consequences uh, coming from that? When we say when, it's everything from, you know, when in a timeline the problem occurs, uh, or when in the timeline do you need to intervene with a solution? Uh, you know, think about it in terms of everything from you know, the disease journey to the user journey as part of uh, defining what that when is. But on, and similarly for the where, thinking about, you know, does this happen at the home? Does this happen uh, as in transit to the hospital? Is this in the clinic? Is it the hospital system? And of course, really the why. Why is this such an important problem to fix right now? Um, and some of the ways to think about the various stakeholders that I mentioned before is really thinking about the five Ps. So really the patients, the providers, the payers, the pharma, or essentially the industry part of, of this. And of course, the patient circle of trust. So really their caregivers, their family members, their friends, their support network, which is obviously even more critical uh, in a time like this when we're all in isolation in some form or shape. So just some final thoughts, be very quantitative, pick a very specific end user in terms of who's gonna be using your solution um, because you know, a problem can be, you know, have multiple facets to it. Really build that persona so that everybody can relate to the problem and better understand it. And then lastly, definitely don't confuse who's your actual end user and your economic buyer, especially here in the United States when you know, those are almost always uh, different entities. Um, so as you can tell, a good uh, problem pitch is something that's uh, described here, where my father is blind and can't tell apart his meds because of all his pills bottles are smooth and similar in size and shape. As a result, he's dependent on me or another family member sorting his medications into containers marked with Braille every time he gets to a refill. So your problem pitch should really be focused on the problems. We don't want to hear anything about solutions or what you think the solution might be. Uh, again, keep yourself open-minded to what those uh, solution, I guess, might ultimately be after your team has formed. So an example of not a good problem pitch is, I want to build an app that analyzes mood and vital sign data. So in short, um, so you'll get, well, I know it says 60 seconds here, but we're, uh, we'll probably move it to 45 seconds uh, for your problem pitches. 
you're welcome to pitch multiple problems. Um, but again, be very specific about the problem you're pitching. Um, don't talk about solutions and really think about this as an active brainstorming session. If you're, you know, hearing somebody else pitch a problem and now that's triggered out some things in your mind, we highly encourage you to come up and pitch your problem. Uh, or if you if somebody else has pitched a problem that you were thinking about pitching, uh, still pitch that problem and provide your perspective and your angle uh, on that problem. Um, so this will be the link where all of the problem pitches will be documented. Um, and basically once you pitch, you'll, there'll be a Slack channel uh, pitch um, number that will be on the, if you go to this link, you'll see uh, already have those uh, set up. So you'll be able to just go directly into those at the end of, after all the problem pitches have been done and meet uh, and talk with the person who initially pitched a problem. And this link will be available um, in each of the tracks. Um, and again, really talk with you know, people with different backgrounds from you uh, and get those diverse perspectives together. And the strongest teams have members that span many areas of expertise. Uh, so with that, uh, we wanted to also say that uh, team registration links will be due, team registration will be due by 10 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Uh, we'll, you should aim for five to seven people on your team. There is a maximum of seven uh, team members. And lastly, just to go briefly over the judging criteria, really thinking about the impact of the problem, essentially what, uh, talking about the problem, the potential impact it has, the innovation aspects, so why is your solution you know, novel? How does it address this particular challenge? Um, this third category is really the implementation part or the viability or feasibility or sustainability. And this is really the part where we say, you know, give us something more concrete that we can better actualize on with our clinical partners, with our you know, whole network of partners that have joined the charge here. And then of course the presentation itself, um, being able to really succinctly and accurately communicate uh, you know, your, your ideas. I also wanted to highlight that there's a whole document that we created, a participant uh, guide essentially, especially as we go all virtual and we're now spread across probably all 24 uh, time zones across the world. Um, and we'll send these links out uh, to, to this uh, guide, but kind of wanted to roughly go through it to let you know what's in here. Everything, pretty much every piece of information you should be looking for will be in here from the challenge prompts to the schedule to links for team formation registration, um, judging criteria, et cetera. Uh, again, team formation will happen shortly. We're running a little bit behind schedule tonight, but uh, essentially each participant, you guys should have all been already assigned into your respective tracks. You should already be in there at this point. Uh, each track will have a separate Zoom room. Um, they should have all been communicated in the respective Slack channels. Um, usually either the, the, the team leads from the MIT team will post those or it'll be in the description of the track itself. Uh, as mentioned, you'll have 45 seconds uh, to pitch um, and then all the ideas will be documented into that uh, problem pitch Google Sheet that we'll share with everybody as well. And then each problem that's pitched will then get a dedicated Slack channel. Uh, you're welcome to instantly go join that channel at, right after you've pitched, but we do ask that you stay in the main, uh, pay attention to the main uh, Zoom uh, room to listen to the other pitches, but also get a better sense of what other people are working on. Maybe there's others that uh, have, uh, are closely related to, to the problem that you're already pitched. And again, you're welcome to pitch multiple problems. You're also welcome to repitch on the same problem if you found that the first time around you didn't articulate it well enough and you, or you found a new different angle to, to frame that problem. Uh, we talked about the team formation and team size. Uh, we'll share the team registration link on this uh, uh, document as well. Some of the tools for virtual communication Slack and Zoom will be the primary methods that our team will be communicating with you. We ask that all the teams um, end up forming a Slack channel for their team. 
and it'll be the primary form of communication both between the organizing team and your team uh, as well as integrating and engaging with the mentors uh, who will essentially come in and drop into your respective uh, Slack channel, so to speak. Uh, we do have the premium version of Slack enabled, so you should be able to use the audio and uh, video phone calls um, and other um, features of Slack. Um, but uh, this will be a good way to try and emulate as much of the human and live interaction as possible with not just only with your fellow team members, but also again with uh, mentors and uh, partners. And there's a full guide as well in terms of how all the Slack channels are structured uh, and how to reach, uh, where to go for, for what type of help. Um, and then there'll be webinars scheduled and those will be scheduled as well. Uh, throughout all the sessions are being recorded in case uh, you want to review uh, what was uh, talked about before um, and uh, as well for people who are on the other side of the world uh, you get a chance to watch these as well um, ready if I could if I could quickly jump in as it relates to the team formation um, so on this, on the Q and A, we've seen a lot of questions, and there has been some confusion about Slack at the moment. So, I want to make it very clear for everyone on the call, and for those that'll watch the recording: if your application was accepted, you RSVP'd, your RSVP was confirmed, then you have been added to Slack. And if you haven't seen, you should have received an email from Slack and it should be somewhere in the spam folder or somewhere in your inbox or somewhere, but you should have that. If you were not accepted, RSVP'd and confirmed, then you were, we do not have capacity to accommodate your application. I hope that clarifies some of it. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Alfonso. Yeah. Um, and then, as mentioned, mentors, they'll be here starting Saturday, 9 a.m. Eastern time, um, all the way through uh, 9 p.m. that evening, and then the following morning from 9 to 12 uh, on Sunday morning, again, Eastern time. Uh, there'll be, as I mentioned earlier, a couple opportunities for practice pitches uh, to really get constructive feedback from the MIT team. Uh, we'll have uh, most of the feedback on the Saturday evening will be again focused on still the, the ideation aspect, the solutions, uh, and really helping you uh, with some constructive feedback there. The feedback on Sunday morning will uh, probably be more focused towards kind of your presentation style, your storytelling, whether, you know, everything flows logically uh, and makes sense um, as well. Um, There'll be limited practice pitches in a sense that I don't think we'll be able to accommodate everybody to be able to, you know, do both sessions. Uh, so certainly if you're interested, um, you know, sign up for those earlier rather than later. Uh, there's a wealth of technical resources uh, that are being provided by our partners, everything from data sets to APIs to platforms. Um, so certainly take uh, advantage of that. Uh, you'll see some of the Slack channels are prefaced by partners or by tech, and those usually are the ways to reach uh, those um, entities if you have any further questions about those. A few policies. Um, I think the code of conduct, which everyone signed uh, when they RSVP via Eventbrite, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we're following the MIT license in terms of open source licensing, uh, in terms of the solutions that come out of this hackathon. Um, also, um, you know, by participating in this hackathon, there'll be photographs or uh, videos or recordings that may be done throughout this event. Uh, so you acknowledge also the use of, um, the, you may be included in some of these photos and videos as well. Uh, but as part of this, because it's of course a lot harder to capture what's happening live, um, you know, there'll be points throughout the weekend where we'll be encouraging you guys to, you know, take a selfie with your team, you know, submit that to us so that we can help, you know, give a window uh, to the rest of the world about what uh, is happening here uh, during this weekend. Uh, and likewise, there'll be opportunities to submit, you know, not just photos and but also short videos if you would like as well that we can share to the rest of the world as well. Um, so the next steps too is, 
you know, really want you guys to also be thinking about uh, what that post hackathon looks like. So, you know, by the end of the weekend, really be thinking, is this something we're going to continue as a team moving forward after the weekend? If so, we definitely want uh, you guys to continue to stay engaged with us as we start uh, building our partners together and developing that pipeline. So there's a lot more information in this document than what I've shared with you uh, here. Um, and so definitely that should be the first place to go to if you have any questions. Uh, and then with that, we are going to split into the 10 different uh, tracks and we'll give people. So, so I think, yeah, we should give people a couple of minutes. Wanted to quickly say this link, you actually have it. You, it's part of that email that you received saying that welcoming you to the event is embedded in there, go get it. If not, we're gonna to continue to provide it. Also now we're gonna we're gonna break out. First of all, I wanted to say thank you again to all the partners that have made this happen, to the Martin Trust Center that Bill Led represented earlier, to the MIT Hacking Medicine Group that has supported sending people to the team of the COVID-19 challenge, as well as giving us part of that structure that has been proven on how to execute these hackathons. And now we're putting it in this virtual environment. And to everyone else that has come in to support to make this happen, both partners across the healthcare ecosystem and the technology ecosystem, as well as volunteers, both students and professionals. So now you should go to your the, the uh, Slack channel that has been assigned to you <clears throat> should be assigned to your track. In that, in that Slack channel, you should see a Zoom link. Join that Zoom link and go, go meet up with your track leads who are going to continue and going to explain how the team formation process works. This is where the fun starts. So <laughs> let's get it started, guys. We'll give you about 10, 15 minutes, take a quick break, but then reconvene uh, on those individual tracks. <laughs> 